Matthew chapter 22. Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parable, and said, Still speaking these Pharisees and the, the priests, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. All right, king, God, son, Jesus Christ. And sent forth his servants, be the prophets, invitations to call them that were bidden. They, you got to read They got uh, we, the invitation. His invitation, go out to those people. Give them the invitation to the wedding. And they would, and they would not come. They refused. Chief priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. God has invited him through Jesus Christ, who is God. Come. We don't want you. We want you dead. You're taking all the all the, the people. You're we envy of you, Pilate said. Again, he sent forth other servants, prophets after prophets. This matches the, the parable of the householder that we just read in 21. All these prophets, they're killing them, they're beating them, they're stoning them, they're sending them away empty. It's one continual parable. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But Israel, but they made light of it, and went their own ways. That's refusing. One to his farm. Another to his merchandise. That's a big change from what God has to offer you. The redmen took his servants, the Old Testament prophets, and entreated and entreated them spitefully and slew them. We saw that with the previous chapter twenty-one, stoning them, killing them. They've been mistreating the prophets, and God still sent his son, and Jesus Christ still came. When you read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, even when they're killing his people that he sent to tell them and to protect them and to love them, See, it's not just one day Jesus just showed up, okay, here I am. you got to realize what the condition of man is. They did not want him, and he still came. And we're talking about a marriage supper here. Let's just talk about a regular supper. Let's say somebody, I know you're not supposed to hate, but let's just say somebody you really hated. Would you invite them to dinner over your house? Would you go all out to plan a great meal for them, even though you don't like them, you don't want anything to do with them? Would you even want to be in their company? And here's a group of people, God's people, God created us, and they hate the Creator. And he's still, listen, he's in Jerusalem. He's going to Calvary now. You would think after this episode, his own priest that he ordained by Moses. If you're not going to receive me, fine. Go to hell. I'm going back to heaven. I can call legions of angels if I want. And he didn't. What? Three people at the cross where he's dying are on his side. His mother, John, and the repentant thief. Anybody else? But we Christians in America today, we expect luxury. We expect it all. We expect everybody to love us. And when the king heard the, thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies. Titus, 70 AD. Joel, chapter 2, yet future. And destroyed those murderers. Killing his men his prophets and burned up their city 21 35 to 39 then saith he to his servants the prophets the wedding is ready 
but they which are bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, as many as ye shall find. Bid them to the marriage. There's no formal invitation now. Find a guy sleeping on the side of the road, invite him. Find a guy with a shovel and putting a sign in the, in the ground, bring him. Guy's walking his donkey, bring him. If he's, he's on a carriage, bring him. I don't care who it is, bring him. So the servants went out into the highway and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. Ooh. And the wedding was furnished with guests, not bride. Get that. These are people who are going to be with us, but we are the bride. They are the guests. This is not New Testament salvation. This is the millennium. There are good and bad in the millennium. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how camest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's Jesus speaking about hell again. Is that a church age saint? Because I don't have the right garment, I'm going to be cast into hell? Be careful where you get your doctrines. Someone who is not fit in the millennium will be cast into the lake of fire. They're not doing it on God's terms. They're doing it their own way. And that's what the church is doing today. You know what the, you know what the poor result that's going to be? There's going to be a lot of people in the church age today. They're going to stand at the great white throne judgment thinking they were saved. And they're not. Because they don't have what God wanted. We came up with all kinds of other things. For many are called. But few are chosen. There's that many and few again. Now watch the reaction. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. We, we want to get him. We've got to shut this guy up. We got to condemn this man. Huddle guys. He's getting a huddle. What can we do? <clears throat> and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians. Now this was the Herod's supporters. Their allegiance to Rome. I guess you would say Americans here. Notice the Pharisees have disciples too. So you got Israel religion and you got the Romans together. Saying Master, not Lord, not God, not Savior, not messiah we know that thou art true and teaches the way of god in truth really that's a bold confession but they don't want the truth they just said jesus christ is preaching the truth and we don't want it how's that neither care <coughs> neither carest thou for any man really you know where he's going in about a week? You know what's going to happen to him in front of the, the, the centurions? You know what's going to happen to him in front of the, the, the Sanhedrin? You know what's going to happen to him on the cross? But he doesn't care for anybody? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? Neither cares thou for... That is a false charge. For thou regardest not the person of men. That's true. I don't care if you're rich. I don't care if you're poor. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're black. I don't care what your position is. I don't care who you are. What is your standing in God? That's what I care about. And the Pharisees have no standing in God. Tell us, therefore, 
Look how bold they tell us. No please, no thank you. What thinkest thou? It's not what it's not really what God thinks. But well, that's it's permission or a personal opinion, not scripture. What thou thinkest. Tell us what your words are, but but don't quote the scripture. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or no? They wanted to accuse Jesus of tax evasion. That's what they wanted to do. And this thing is so strong today that churches need to read this. Is it lawful to give tribute a tax unto Caesar or no? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. He knew it was a trick question. And said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Verse 15, they wanted to entangle him. They didn't want to know about the taxes. They probably didn't pay him themselves. But they wanted to trick him. Show me the tribute money. And they bought him a penny. That's how much they made in, in the vineyard after one day's work, wasn't it? And he said unto him, Whose is this image in superscription? You know, it would be a picture of Abraham Lincoln on the one side and a building on the other side. George Washington on one side and an eagle on the other side. Things haven't changed, have they? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then says he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And how many churches claim tax exemption? and the pastors thereof when you unfold a green piece of money that says the United States of America on it it's not yours don't have your name on it we take a coin and it says the United States of America on it and it has a picture that is not your picture you know who he's talking to he's talking to the religion he's saying hey if it's Caesar's, give to Caesar's. If it's God, give to God's. And he said a penny. That was a day's wage. You're supposed to pay taxes according to Jesus Christ. How are you doing on that one? Stu, I think a lot of people, judgment seat of Christ, are going to find themselves at fault. When they had heard these words, they marveled. And left them and went their way. They left. You know why? Because they're guilty. They're not paying their taxes. Instead of catching them at their word, Jesus made them guilty. Where they wanted him to be guilty. And I wonder if he I wonder if Peter had to receive that fish of the coin that he went and paid the taxes. I believe Jesus would have kept those receipts because it would have been proper to keep receipts. Judas was a treasurer. He would have to keep some kind of book. So these people, these religionists, were found guilty of taxes in front of Jesus Christ. The same day, they just don't let up on him, do they? They want him destroyed. It says somewhere in one of the Gospels. Destroyed. Then came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. Please mark that in your Bible. This is funny. This is really funny. You have been any kind of public ministry, you're going to find this in the public ministry eventually. And asked him, saying, Master, again, Master, not God, Messiah. Moses said, if a man die and have no children, his brother shall marry his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Perfectly right. And let me see if I can find that reference. Deuteronomy 25.5. Okay, that's correct. Now, once upon a time, long, long, long place, there were, uh, there were, yeah, there were with us seven brethren. 
And the first, when he had married a wife, it doesn't sound like the story is true, when he married a wife, deceased and had no issue, no child, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third, and the seventh. Evidently, the barrenness is with this woman. The last of all the women, the woman died also. Therefore, in the what? You don't believe in resurrection. Why are you asking this question? This is not even a question that they want an answer because they don't even believe. But in the resurrection, Jesus. You don't believe in the resurrection. Why are you asking this question? I mean, how did you know where to get all the animals? Out? You don't care. You don't want to care. You don't believe in the story anyway. Whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, that's, a, that's a very good question, though. When we all get to heaven, what is life going to be like for us? It's a very proper question. But they're asking the question to trick them because they're asking a question on doctrine that they don't believe. My question would be to, to God, my family, will I know who my family is in heaven? Will we recognize each other? But let's go. He's gonna he's gonna attack the, he's gonna burn their butt high. They're not gonna be able to sit down for a week. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err. Ooh. Not knowing the scriptures. What? You don't know anything about the resurrection. You know how many resurrections there are in the old testament? Even even Herod believed in resurrection. He thought John the Baptist came back from the grave. Herod had more sense than these Sadducees. No resurrection, there's no hope. Where do you go? You're not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. What is the power of God? That's the resurrection. He's not addressing the question. He's directing their unbelief in what God can do for you. If Christ never rose from the grave, Paul said, and our religion's vain, we just go out, eat, drink, and be merry. But the fact is that our Savior's tomb is empty. And he is seated at the right hand of God. That is the power of salvation in all my faith and my hope. Because guess what's going to happen one day? Whether I die or I'm alive, I'm going. Yeah. Without gas, without fuel, without God power. So, what's the world saying? Superpowers. I got God power. I got God power. For in the resurrection, you see how you just attacked them? Wait a minute. Do you want to know about the resurrection? You don't believe in the resurrection. But in the resurrection, you see how you, there is a resurrection. Now, the people are standing around, know these people, they know what they believe. And Jesus said, in the resurrection, He's making these people look like fools before the group, the, the, uh, the multitude. In the resurrection, now this is, this is us, this can be us, they neither marry. There's no marriage in heaven, but the bride to Jesus Christ. Now if I go marry somebody in heaven as a bride of Jesus Christ, I'd be committing adultery against him. So I won't marry, but Jesus nor are given in marriage but are as as the angels of god in heaven so the angels don't marry but as teaching the resurrection of the dead here we go again this touching the resurrection of the dead have ye not read Whew. You imagine walking up to your Sunday school teacher who doesn't know anything, little child. Did you read here in the Bible? It says right here, teacher. Have you not read that which was spoken unto you? Ooh. What would Jesus do? Phew, their butt is bred by God, saying, Now, man, my eyes are going Z. 
do you be? This is going to be a quote from Exodus 3 6. Jesus said Exodus 3 6 was spoken by God if you got any problems. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, no Ishmael, and the God of Jacob. Aren't they dead? Long time. They lived a long life and they've been dead a long time. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Today, for the Christian to be absent from the body and present for the Lord. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now that Jesus has not died yet. This is going to get funny in here in a minute. Let's bear with me. They are in a place called Abraham's bosom, according to Jesus in, in Luke chapter, I think it's 15, right? These guys don't believe in the resurrection. Can we jump ahead to when Jesus died? What happens when Jesus dies on that cross? Doesn't the Bible say the Old Testament saints arose from the grave, started walking around, and it looks like that 40 days he was there? Can you imagine these Sadducees getting visited by someone? Hi, who are you? I'm Isaac. But you didn't believe in the resurrection. Just came to tell you guys that. Isn't this funny? Because there's a there's a resurrection of the Old Testament saints that are in Abraham's bosom when Jesus dies. That that's so funny. He's almost like saying, "Prepare to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a few days, boys." Joel and uh, he just named them all Noah. And when the multitude, see the multitudes there, they're hearing Jesus rebuke these guys, and you just see him clapping. <laughs> heard this they were astonished at his doctor like whoa did you just see he put that pastor down the greatest pastor of old Jerusalem man he sunk him the guy's got the radio all across radio Israel man he just sunk his boat whoa and they also got a new revelation about death even Job writes and David right you know what happens when you go in the grave we can't praise you no more Lord and it kind of sense it's true until Jesus dies on that cross then those that are in Abraham's bosom are rising up from the grave and praising God today we're absent from the body and present with the Lord but <clears throat> when the Pharisees oh come on guys knock it off I, I, you know how stupid wrestling is? You know how fake it is? I picture the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes. Okay, your turn. Tag, you know. I just got my butt whipped on the thing. <laughs> touch. Your turn. They used, to, they used to have one where they would touch, and then, you know, the other guy would come in the ring and, and get beat up. And when he when he couldn't do it, he goes, come and touch me. Come on. You know, it's so fake. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, silence. They were put away in 22. They walked away. That's it. We're gone. Sadducees step up and they're sitting there with a jaw in the dirt. Ugh. Had put the Sadducees aside. They were gathered together. Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Herodians are now in a union meeting. We got to get rid of this guy. We're going to have a town council meeting and get rid of that preacher on the street there because we can't stand this truth. Did you see how he treated that guy? Opened up that Bible and made him offended in tears. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. They're not done. Doesn't Jesus have patience and long suffering with these? I'm glad none of these idiots come up on me because I tell you, after the second time, I would have been worried out and, and sarcasm would have been coming out like rivers of water. I'm sorry. I'm not as graceful, as long suffering, as patient as Jesus is. But here comes a lawyer now. Ask him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, that means nothing. Because they're not serving him, are they? So why are they saying, Master? Which 
is the great commandment in the law. Now they're going to get him in the law. Now they're going to get him with Moses. We can't get him with taxes. We can't get him on marriage. All right, let's let's go back to the law. You know that they got blown by the law before. Jesus said unto, unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Now that is the of the Jewish person. There is nothing greater in the Bible for a Jewish man to love thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. They don't believe it, but that's, I forget, I got where that's written in uh, Deuteronomy 6.5. I got the Jewish name that they call this, but I don't have it here. But there's a special Jewish name for it. This is the first and great commandment. Now, what is this commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord with the, the first commandment is God first always. Second commandment, no other gods, no other idols, no more images. Third, the Lord's name shall not be taken in vain. Those three commandments are all about God. All that heart, soul, and mind. You're all in all. Those are the three beginnings of the Ten Commandments. No one ever follows all those. You don't wake up before you wake up and thank God. I guarantee you don't do that. You know, when when somebody flushes the toilet in the house and they all of a sudden just turn to, to the water in the shower, you don't think of God right away. You grab that handle. This is the first and greatest commandment. God first. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Others next. Thou shalt honor thy mother and father. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not steal. Thou... Those are your reactions to people. You don't offend people. You don't do things wrong to people. The Ten Commandments is your relationship to God and to your to others. That's what the Ten Commandments are. You break them down. So what he's done, he's taken the Ten Commandments and made them into two. God first, others next. There's no you. There's no 39A verse and then yourself. It's God first and then your neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jezebel didn't do too good when she had Naboth killed. That widow that took care of Elijah did good because she took care of God's prophet and fed him and gave him a place to stay. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, oh, here he goes, saying, what think ye of Christ? It's him. Whose son is he? And they said unto him, the son of David. Only because through Joseph they're saying this. That's the lineage of Matthew. And Mary's lineage goes to David too. It just splits off at the boys of, of David. So it's true. We're David. The proper answer would have been that Peter said the Son of God. Peter knew more than the Pharisees knew. And they're also proclaiming that the royal ship, the kingly line of Jesus Christ when they say the Son of David. He said unto them, How then does David, he's addressing David, in spirit, call him capital L O R D? You've been calling me Master. <laughs> he's getting them now. You said Master, Master, Master. Well, okay. How does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord, all right, now he's going to quote, The Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, said unto my Lord, capital L O R D. Sit thou in my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. That's God speaking to Jesus Christ, but David wrote it. And 
And we know that with scripture with scripture. He just said, okay, if I'm on David, how does David say that God has spoken to him, sit down into thy enemies, be your footstool, David's dead. It's not David. It's God speaking to the son. He said, well, he says capital L-O-R-D. It's not, they're the same. The only difference right now that Jesus, he's in the flesh and he's going to take that sin. In God, there is no sin. But when they've been calling him master, 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 they don't believe he's God. So he brings the question out, listen, I'm Christ. And God, through the scriptures, through David, has pointed me to be the Christ of God. And you guys, sit down my right hand. That is where he is right now. You're my enemies. You know what I'm going to do one day to you boys? I'm going to sit up on my throne and I'm going to put my feet on your head. Remember reading in the Old Testament where Joshua said, put your feet on their necks and they, and they slain them? That's what's going on here. Victory. Jesus Christ will be the victor over all the wicked. If David then called him Lord, capital L, how is he his son? They couldn't understand it. The capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is speaking when David wrote. He is speaking to his son. It had nothing to do with David. David just wrote it down. Jesus is telling you, oh, men wrote the Bible. Yes, he did. But the Holy Spirit inspired David to write that. That's what he's telling you. And you will not be able to get this verse down. Anybody go, oh, men wrote the Bible. They won't understand. We do. And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. And then in the next chapter, Lord willing, man, he's going to start blasting them. And what we just read at this real quick, look at 7, 8, and 9 of chapter 23. He's going to go into, from where he is now, he's going to go into religious titles. He's on the subject right now, religion. You call me master, you call me master, you don't mean it. Now he's going to go into what they've been calling the people these hierarchies and it means nothing 